Hello, it's uh, March 8th, 2024. We're here at the Tombaugh Museum Center, and we're here today to interview Stephen Hall and get some of his memories of growing up in the Tombaugh area and have his Hall family. And um, this is part of our ongoing <clears throat> oral history project here in Tombaugh. You can see this video and our other videos at our YouTube channel, at Tombaugh Museum. Would you give us your full name, Stephen? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, Stephen Lewis Hall. And when were you born? 1956. And where were you born? I was born in Methodist Hospital in Houston, Texas, but my uh, family was residing here in Tomball at the time. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, have you lived in Tomball long? <laughs> yeah. Yes, I have. I guess, uh, of course, grew up here and went through all through Tomball schools here. And then aside from... Uh, my college years up in, uh, in Dallas at SMU, of course, I was back and forth here during then. Uh, and then uh, the first few years that uh, Laurel and I were married, we lived in Houston. So, but then beyond that, so probably about 60 plus years. So, yeah, almost all my life. What's mm -hmm. Laurel's full name? Laurel's name is uh, Laurel uh, Ann Brown Hall. And she also graduated Tomball High, right? She did, yes. What year was she? She graduated in 1976, and what, I was, I was 74. 74. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, do y'all have kids? We do. Two daughters, uh, Hannah Jennifer Hall uh, and Rebecca Carolyn Hall, two girls. Mm -hmm. And do you have um, grandkids? We do have one grandson, uh, Dean Lewis Harrisberger, and uh, he is the son of uh, Becca Rebecca goes by Becca, and, uh, and Zach Harrisberger. So she's married to Zach, and um, they live nearby too, which is good. That's great. Mm -hmm. And tell us about your siblings. So i um, got uh, two brothers and a sister. I'm one of four. Uh, Roy Hall, Roy C. Hall III is my oldest brother, and he went to Tomball High School, uh, graduated in 1964, and then Ellen... Uh, Ellen Knapp Hall, Ellen Hall Stutz now, is uh, my sister, graduated in 67. Uh, and then Carl Hall, next, next to me, next brother to me, graduated in 71, I believe it was, or 70, excuse me. And, uh, and then me, in 74. And what was your mother's name? Uh, Carolyn, Carolyn Hall, and her, uh, her maiden name was Knapp, K-N-A-P-P, Carolyn Knapp Hall. And where were the, the Knapp family from? The Knapp family, uh, she, uh, my mom grew up in Houston. Her parents uh, lived in Houston for all of my mom's uh, life and her sister Elizabeth also. Uh, and they came to Houston. Mr. Knapp, uh, his family had lived in San Angelo, Texas before coming to Houston. He came to Houston to uh, attend at the time in 1912 the Rice Institute, now Rice University. And uh, that's where he met his uh, bride-to-be, Anna Ricketts Knapp, uh, who, uh, was her, whose family was from Tyler, Texas at the time. She came to, to Rice as well a couple of years later, and, uh, and they got married and then uh, eventually had two daughters, Carolyn and Elizabeth, my mom, Carolyn. Mm -hmm. And what was your dad's full name? Dad's name, Roy C. Hall, Jr., was his was his full name? Where was he born? He was born in Tomball, Texas, actually, and um, in a in his his parents lived out here at the time and was born actually uh, in in a house. Uh, I'm not sure if there's because there wasn't a hospital. I guess maybe that was the case, uh, but uh, it's in, it's a house that was located at the time, I believe, at uh, Pine Street and Main Street, the intersection of Pine and Main, where there was a uh, for many years, uh, uh, I think there was a doctor's office there, Dr. Coker, I want to say, and, uh, and then after that, for many years after that, there was a donut shop, uh, Snowflake Donuts, and I used to tell our kids that their grandfather, of course, you know, lived, was born and raised and lived in a donut shop, which they thought that was pretty cool. And, and that's the southwest corner? I think southwest, yes, southwest corner, yeah. Okay. And there's now a new, brand new, spanking new uh, Snowflake Donuts there, but yeah, that's where he... He lived there until about, uh, with his family, of course, until about, I think, 1930. He was born in 1921. 
when uh, my grandparents moved back into Houston, and the story we always heard was is that, the, of course, that was the, right in the middle of the Great Depression, that I think the, the Tomball schools were, had run out of money. And so they went back into Houston to finish up schooling, and he graduated from uh, San Jacinto High School back then. And then mm -hmm. when did he come back out after that? Uh, so after that, he, uh, he, he went to, he went, well, after high school, he went to SMU in Dallas, Southern Methodist University. And just to meet, and of course, the, the, the World War II was, was brewing and, and going on already happening in, in Europe. And it became evident that the United States was, was probably going to get involved, and which they did, which we did, of course. And uh, so in 1943, just shortly after graduation from college, which, by the way, he always felt very fortunate to have been able to, to graduate from college. Many, many, many boys did not. Uh, but uh, he, he, I think he, he had enough time in between to, to marry my mother uh, and then report for, um, for training up in New York and then off to, to Europe uh, for the war, which he was in the, in the Normandy invasion. Um, he was in the Navy? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did, did he go through midshipman school in, in New York? Or? He did, at Columbia, Columbia University is where they held it there, yeah. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, I heard that was a pretty rough training for young midshipmen. <laughs> I, I, I think they put him through it. I don't think there was much doubt about what, where they were headed and, and what was going to be coming. Did he tell uh, you stories about that training he got there? He didn't tell me a lot of stories, really, about the training. And In fact, I, I, you know, there was not a lot really shared or spoken about it, um, and at least until, certainly until I was into adulthood, and, and then only if I would, you know, ask questions, he, he would tell me. But that, I don't know, I think that generation, well, my dad, uh, for certain, just was fairly quiet about it, and I think there was just a great sense of, of duty about that whole thing, and, and so there wasn't, uh, but they put him through it. I mean, they, they definitely put him through the training. And, and where uh, did he go after his training with the Navy? Well, he got, uh, he boarded, um, some big large ship. I, uh, it might have been, you know, I think the Queen Mary was, was taking boys back and forth from... Anyway, but, uh, it, they went over to, to, to England, which is where they were uh, uh, kind of forming up and getting ready for what I think most of them knew beforehand it was going to be some form of an invasion. And um, that's where they went, and that's what they did. And you brought some... Uh... Mm -hmm. Photos and a, mm -hmm. and a flag here today. Show us and tell us about those. Yeah, so there's a flag here that um, was in our home growing up. Uh, and you can see it's well, or you'll see it's got 48 stars and kind of tattered and a little discolored. And, and it was on a, a landing craft that my dad was on uh, in the Normandy invasion. And there's a little, uh, you can probably film that later, Bob, I guess. Anyway, a little, little story about it. It just says that in World War II, uh, this flag flew on landing craft 809 during the Normandy invasion of June the 6th, 1944. Which beach did they go in? Does it say? Yeah. It does say. It says uh, Utah Beach. Utah. <laughs> That's pretty tough duty back then. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was. And so I guess so, he would have been one of the men driving the boat, right? Yeah, I think so. They might have had somebody that was the, I, I don't know all the terms. He was, he was second in command on that craft, and they made two landings that day. Uh, and I think each time transported about 70 inf infantrymen uh, to the beach and, and got back out of there as fast as they could, you know, and, and, um, and lived to tell about it. Yeah, that's amazing. And this photo you had here, tell us about that. So have? this is a photo of Dad and, I, uh, and my mother, my mother and Dad. And, um, and I'm guessing it, it may have been around the time they were married. But obviously he was in the service, uh, but I think it was before. There's not a lot of, um, you know, uh, insignia and that sort of thing on the uniform. So uh, because later there was. But that uh, was... Probably back in, maybe that was about the time they got married and before he was shipping off. Uh, there was a little break in time between the officer's training school and, uh, you know, reporting for duty to go. Uh, so my dad always kidded that that was one of those wartime marriages, you know, that didn't work out. For <laughs> How long were you married? 40, oh gosh, it was 40, I believe 42 years, I think. 41 or 42 years, yeah. 1920. 
three, no, 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 that's wrong, 1943, excuse me, uh, until uh, his death in 1985. That's a good record. Mm -hmm. um, did he talk about uh, what he did after, um, after that Normandy invasion? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Where did they send him? Well, after the invasion, I think they, they spent a lot of time still near the beach uh, area setting up um, uh, the ports and, 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 and harbor situations to where the supply ships that went on for months, if, if not years, after that initial invasion would come uh, to France and, 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 and tanks and shipments and supplies and things would offload and go inland and to support and supply the ongoing you know war effort but the navy people stayed uh in the port in the port area there he, I, I do know he was uh Cherbourg was was mentioned um there was a uh, one uh, little funny thing i'll tell you there was a lot of letters written back and forth and but they were all uh, censored i guess is the word they were looked at though before they were you know sent in the mail by the military because they didn't want any uh secrets or perhaps even locations given away about where they were, so my dad was would try to communicate where he was to mother back home. This was after the initial invasion. And of course, I'll, let me sidetrack it just to say that, you know, the people back home, they might not have known the news of what was happening for, you know, weeks in some cases. I mean, we obviously didn't have internet and weren't calling on the phone about it. Um, and, and it was literally, uh, the, the civilian people anyway were, were, would find out about things by, uh, there were newspapers. There was some coverage of that. But as far as where your specific loved ones were, you just weren't going to know that unless you got letters from them. And then even then, back to the mail situation, the uh, military didn't want. So one thing my, um, my dad did, which I heard them talk about this later, he was in, um, he talked about, he said in a letter to my mother that, that, a, that a gentleman that they both knew back home here, who was just a fine gentleman, and, 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 it's, and he, he said, I'm just going to make up the name, I can't remember, so I'm going to say Mr. Smith. He said, you know, Mr. Smith is just so foul-mouthed. And my mother knew that was not the case of this Mr. Smith, I'm making up the name, but the gentleman that they knew, and what my dad, it, it, it dawned on her after a little while, he was telling her that he was in Falmouth uh, <laughs> of England, and that's where he was at the time. Yeah. So I thought that was kind of clever. But um, they were they were pretty pretty uh, had to be pretty tight lipped about all that, and they did have letters, which many of which we 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 still have, which are kind of fun. That's a good record. Do you have any other Navy photos? Mm. Well, let's see here. I'm, I'm, well, there's a yeah, there's a little <laughs> a little small one of of my uncle Howard, who was in the Coast Guard in World War II, and my my dad who was in the Navy. That I guess at some point they were. Um, I don't know where this was taken. Maybe when they had come back home, they maybe had, I don't think they had leave in the middle of the war, but perhaps before they maybe shipped off. Um, After the Navy and when mm -hmm. he finally made it back to the U.S., uh, what, what did he do then? So when he came back home, um, he uh, went to work at the, uh, at the Ford Motor Company, Hall Motor Company, uh, in Tomball that my uh, grandfather, grandparents, uh, had purchased from, I believe it was a, a Mr. Robinson in 1920. Uh, so that's where he came to work with, it, with his dad. And then a couple of years later when Howard, my Uncle Howard, got out of the service, uh, he did too. So they worked in the, uh, at the Ford dealership here in Tomball, which was in the 100 block of, of West Main. I guess they would call that West Main on just this one block this side. Of, right across the street now from where uh, Main Street Crossing is, which of course formerly was where the the Bradingham's grocery store was, the IGA store was for years, but that's where so, it was located. Mm -hmm. So the Main Street Crossing mm -hmm. is on the south side of Main. Correct. And right across the street was Hall Motor Company? Correct, yes, and a couple of other businesses, but yeah. Hall Motor Company, and then they had a, uh, uh, was on that block there, and I don't even know what that side street is. Is that Walnut? Well, or Elm is the one right by the tracks. Elm by the tracks, yeah. So they were on the other street, uh, uh, the other the next, part of that block. The next one to the west, right? Correct, yeah, okay. yeah. Great. That's, so, um, did you ever hear stories of, of how your grandfather got in the Ford Motor Company business? Well, the, uh, a little bit. He, um, I mean, not not a lot, I guess. But I, I think from what I've read, not so much what I heard, but what I've read uh, that Mr. Robinson 
uh, wanted to, to get out and I think in part because Ford was sending him tractors to sell, and I don't think he wanted to sell tractors. I, wanted to, I think he wanted to sell the, uh, the, the vehicles, I guess the Model A's or Model T's or whatever. And uh, that was the story I've read. I, I presume that's true. But anyway, he wanted to sell, and I think that uh, someone with the Ford Motor Company uh, in Houston uh, contacted, I guess, my grandfather, and they struck a deal, and he ended up... He ended up and I will say this, he, this, this is ringing a bell now. He did work for the Jacoby Pearson uh, Motor Company at the time. So that was a Ford dealership in Houston. And I, I guess my, my grandfather was a, a salesman uh, and, and so knew the, knew the car business. And I guess it was an opportunity for him to, to, uh, to own one. So he, and what he was his for. full name? His full name was uh, Roy C. Hall. Mm-hmm. Don't ask me what the C stands for because... It's C, period. That's what it is. <laughs> uh, but people around Tomball, they called him Roy? I think they called him Roy, That's yeah, I, as far I'd as I know. Always, I'd always heard people refer to him as Roy, but mm-hmm. so many other people around Tomball, they just use their initials. So yeah, know, that's true. Good point. Good point, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, <clears throat> yeah, now, now uh, my oldest brother, Roy, <laughs> Roy C. Hall III, when he was a teenager and uh, maybe some summer jobs, you know, in between school would work down there as well. And I'm not sure, they might have called him Lil Roy, which I'm not sure he loves that today. But anyway, he's, he was Lil Roy, or they might have called him Roy Boy. But I'm not sure. There's yeah. a lot of Roys running around there for a while. But, but anyway, my grandfather did die, though, in 19, I want to say 1950, uh, before I was born. And so then, from, and that was just a few years after, the, you know, after Roy and my dad Roy and Howard, my Uncle Howard, had gotten out of the service, had gotten home from the war, and they, they took it over and, and, and continued running it until, along with my, my grandmother, was still part of the, the ownership, uh, called her Mamma, Nellie, Nellie Reynolds Hall, um, until the late 60s, the late 1960s, yeah. And what is that Ford dealer now? That Ford dealership is a small little place down at uh, 249 in Spring Cypress Road, Tomball Ford. So uh, it went through a couple of iterations, and then uh, Tom Keating and, and the Keating family uh, ended up buying it, I want to say in the very early 1970s, somewhere in there, and they've owned it ever since. Um, and it's just, it's just grown so, so big and, and wonderful. I think it's been a great thing for them. They were on 249. Uh, just a little bit south of 2920 for some years. Business right? 249. The business, yeah, business 240, exactly. Business 249. And then, uh, and then uh, bought property. Actually, I think did some sort of a, uh, I don't know if it's 1035, some sort of uh, land exchange trade with the hospital um, and, and then moved down to um, where they are today. Hmm. With that. So the locations <clears throat> where your grandfather and your father had Hall Motor Company. Mm-hmm. Um, about how long was it there on Main Street at that location, the 100 block? I would say from, well, the earliest pictures I've seen with Mr. Robinson in them were from uh, from 1920, probably a little bit before, all the way to the late 60s. So that entire time when it was Hall Motor Company, and then probably a few years after, it was, it was right there on Main Street in the 100 block. What was your grandmother's full name? My grandmother uh, on the Hall side was uh, Nellie Reynolds Hall. This was a cool mm-hmm. photo. Should yeah. Show that to the camera. Okay. What, where, what is this? That is my, uh, that's my grandfather, Roy C. Hall Sr., uh, out in front of the gas pumps at, uh, at the Hall Motor Company. And that's the that original mm-hmm. location we were talking about. It is. Yeah, it is. Street. It is. And now it's a store called uh, Covey, I believe. Covey, uh, it's got apparel and different things in there. They've done a really nice job. I think the, the, the bones of that building are still there. Hmm. I do have a, 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 a funny, well, I think it's kind of funny. My, you know, one of the, you might say a perk of being in the family of a car dealer is that you get, you, you, they drive dealer cars home, right? So if a new car came out, you know, the Mustang, has not been around forever, but in the six, early 60s, I believe it was introduced, right? So uh, there was one year my mother always kind of wanted to, uh, to have a Mustang, and, uh, but, you know, it, 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 business first, so if somebody else you know, wanted that kind of thing. But she got to drive a, a, a Mustang 
for a little while, and I, I remember the story that one day, and of course, you know, the inventory was nothing like today. You know, they might have had six or eight or ten new cars uh, on the lot in their, in their inventory, might have a few used cars too, but uh, my mother went to the grocery store, I believe it was at Klein's, uh, supermarket to go to go shopping in her new Mustang went in and, uh, and did her shopping and came out and the car was missing the car was gone so she was concerned of course and, and called down to the dealership to talk to dad and, and he informed her well they had sold it so she <laughs> she would have to find a, another ride home apparently no they sent somebody for her case but that was the case where you know somebody a customer wanted to buy a Mustang, so they went down there and picked it up. And, <laughs> so they learned, I think my mother learned to uh, hold on to those new cars loosely <laughs> because they weren't. <laughs> they were inventory. <laughs> they, there was inventory, that's exactly right. You know, the customer, anyway. But um, another little sidebar, too, I've always wondered if they got out of the car business uh, when they did, uh, my folks because they knew I was going to be getting my license pretty soon, so they wanted to st keep me away from the new cars. But anyway, I don't think that's true, but I used to wonder. <laughs> yeah. Do you have memories as a kid and going to the dealership? I do, yes. I, I have memories of going in and going into my dad's office and, and seeing the, the people around there in the dealership. I was pretty little. By the time they got out of it, I was really not old enough to have worked there. I was, I guess, 12-ish, 12. -ish, 12. Um, but I was down there a, a good bit. I did, uh, I gravitated to the, uh, I think there was a Coke machine. I liked that. That was pretty special. Uh, you weren't getting Cokes just willy-nilly uh, anytime you might want one. Uh, so that was the thing. But now, uh, but my older brother Roy worked there. I think I mentioned that. And I think Carl may have too. But one thing that my, uh, my dad did was uh, he opened, built and opened a, uh, a car wash, a little two-bay car wash where you did it yourself, self, self-serve self thing, and there's Brillo pads for the white walls, which we don't really have those anymore, and, uh, you know, a chamois dispenser and all that sort of thing, and it was directly across the streets where there's a parking lot, what's really, I think it's basically a, mainly a dirt parking lot now to the side of, uh, of Main Street Crossing, uh, and, but anyway, that's where it sat, and it was called the Swifty Clean Car Wash. Uh, and so I think for a quarter, you'd get probably five minutes with the high pressure wand. And, and uh, I, did, I worked there a pretty good bit because they kept that after the dealership uh, was, was sold. And uh, my brother Carl and I would kind of the maintenance crew for the, uh, so we'd keep the machines full of, of chamois and brillos and we'd empty out the vacuum. And, and the worst part was the, we called it the sump, but the sumps where the, where all the dirt and everything drained down into, we'd have to shovel those things out and, which wasn't particularly fun, but that was that's that was that was probably one of my first jobs was yeah. an early teenager doing that. Riding my rode my bicycle down there to to do it. So, uh, which you could do in Tomball, you could ride your bicycle pretty much all over town, and not only not worry about your safety so much, but not worry about getting run over or, or any of those things. So, that was kind of a nice thing about growing up in Tomball too. So was Hall Motor Company, when they owned it, always at that location, or did it have a different location before you sold it? I, I believe that was the only location that I'm aware of. Yeah, uh, yeah. They, they, um, I think they might have had plans one day to perhaps head out toward what now is Business 249, but uh, sold it before, yeah. before that happened. But one little, other little story I'll, I'll just mention about... Um, the, the employees and mechanics and the people in the parts department. A couple of things I'll say. One, one is, uh, you, you, many of you all may, are going to recall the name Joe Sebesta. And, uh, you know, his, his mom or his parents had, had the, the cafe, what became City Cafe, I think, for a good, a good long while. But Joe Sebesta worked for the Ford dealership, beginning with, with my family, just as a kid in high school, uh, you know, in all the different departments, you know, parts and, and sales, he did everything, but he stayed with them and he went on to work and continue and retire from uh, the Keating uh, Ford dealership. So we used to kid him about how he had a hard time keeping a job, but he did everything. And I think retired down there as the general manager of the, of the Ford dealership was a key, right? But he was a great, great dear friend of the Hall family, that's for sure. Um, the, the, um, an, another thing I was just going to mention about employees is that back in, Tom, uh, back in those days, Tomball had a volunteer fire department. 
and there was a big, uh, a big fire whistle, fire siren, I guess you'd say, in the middle of town, which blew every day at noon, just, I guess, to let everybody know it was noon time and time for lunch. Uh, but also, if there was a fire call that came in, that siren would go. It would go off, and everybody within probably a couple of miles could hear that thing. Uh, but if you were a volunteer fireman, that was a signal to get yourself to the fire station and load up and go. Well, it, I, bel- I think it was just a couple of blocks. It was, anyway, numerous haul em- uh, motor company employees, mechanics and things, probably at least half a dozen or so were volunteer firemen. And the place would vacate, you know, when, <laughs> when there was a fire. And, uh, but, of course, the town needed that. They needed uh, the volunteers, and they were, they'd, off they'd go to, to fight the fire and, and deal with the, whatever the fire situation was. But I, I do remember that, thinking oh, that, was, that was interesting. So uh, there were two Tomball books that I got some yeah. of the articles and photos out of. Yes. One, one was Leslie Upchurch's, what I call the red book. Right. And the other was the orange um, Jubilee book. Mm-hmm. But um, this, this talked about uh, Ford Motor Company and your dad buying it in 1920. And mm-hmm. it mentioned in 1929, he sold it to Teddy Vaught, but then... A year or two later, bought it back. Yes. Halls bought it back. Do you, do you ever hear anything about that? I, no, I did not. Yeah. And, and I've heard the name Teddy Vote, of course. Yeah. But uh, I read, the, you know, there's, like we said earlier, sometimes, you know, our history is, is the history. Our own history is. So I'm not sure uh, which is exactly right, but I mean, I presume that's correct. Yeah, it's showing and, a couple of yeah. pictures of the, the uh-huh, motor company. Uh huh. Yeah, those are neat. Yeah, the. Um, but yeah, I, w- I wasn't completely uh, aware of that, but, uh, but there you go. Yeah. And then uh, this had some of the employees and some of the... Yes, yes, right. All motor company. This yeah. picture, which is, is uh, that we have a bigger version of it someplace, but appears to be like when there was maybe a, a parade getting ready to happen. A lot of people standing around outside. I think my pappy's in there and uh, my, my grandmother and I think mom and dad are back kind of behind. Or it might have been Harris County Fair time or something. You know, that went on here. Yeah. Uh, and the top left. Mm-hmm. What's that one? That top uh, picture. Mm-hmm. Uh, it looks like, like when Governor Alan Shivers was here. And okay. Like a lot of your family were there to, as part of the welcoming crew. Well, good. Yeah. Huh. You, you had mentioned earlier before we were mm-hmm. on camera about mm-hmm. some of the people that worked there going on to have their own auto businesses. Tell yeah. us about that again. Yes. Well, um, I'm... Be nice if I had the article in front of me. That's okay. The the, uh, the, the there were I know that there were uh, two uh, Fairley brothers F E H R L E is that right or did I have that backwards? Anyway, who were mechanics? I think you got it right for Hall Motor Company for a number of years, and then uh, opened up their own auto repair shop in town. Uh, Fairley Brothers, and then uh, I think for for a time I, I believe Millard Ford. Uh, senior uh, worked at Hall Motor Company, and then of course they, the, the Ford family, went and um, uh, started the uh, Chevrolet dealership here in Tomball, and then and, and his sons uh, joined him there, Millard Jr. and, and Roy and Homer, and then also there was a, a, a an F O uh, Mr. Johnson, an F O Johnson, uh, who later opened up and had Johnson Pontiac. In Tomball, which which was always I recall down at uh, what we used to call Four Corners. Uh, right. So there was a lot of uh, uh, people. You know, I, I think early on in the probably in the twenties and thirties, there might or even in the forties, might not have been enough business for several dealerships. But Tomball grew and had multiple car dealerships and auto repair shops and things. Those were good people. Mm-hmm. So you were talking earlier about. Um, that house that later became a donut shop. Mm-hmm. There were two houses. Um, these are very small photos, but there's uh, 401 West Main Street. I think that's where you were mm-hmm. talking about. Yeah. It looks like that was a Roy Hall right. family. Right, yep. And I read in, a, in, in one publication that that was where uh, yeah, the Roy Hall senior family lived for... Their time in Tomball, I guess, while they lived here. I guess maybe at least 1920 to 1930, something like that. And this shows that then it was the Dr. Coker home for mm. many years. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then this is a side view. It looks like the same same house, but a side yeah, view. Yeah, I think, 
It that, calls it the hole in the wall. I guess yeah, that's, I'm not uh, sure why that, that is. might be the donut shop. Maybe I donut. think so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, and I and I think that uh, that you know we enjoy a lot of things today. We may not have the Harris County Fair right here, although I did read recently. I think it's going to come back out this direction toward somewhere off of 99 in a few years. I, I read, but there are a lot of things that that uh, a lot of our forefathers and people with a lot of vision. Um, organized and, and, and made happen, gosh, you know, we're talking about over 100 years ago maybe at this point, that we still benefit from today. There's, um, um, it's not 100 years ago, but I do remember back in the, in the or not remember, I remember hearing this story <clears throat> that uh, the, the, there, there was a group of, of, of citizens, men from Tomball, who went up to a, uh, to a highway meeting in Austin. And this was back when 149 was but just two lanes, maybe 50 or 60 feet of right away from here all the way to, to what became Interstate 45. Probably then it was 75. Uh, but, and, and the idea was is that we, they just felt like, you know, if we could get better roads from Houston out to Tomball, uh, that would just benefit us, you know, in, in the long run. And... So they went up there, and, and they, the they is, and the only, I can only remember three of the four. I think there were four gentlemen, but one of them was Mr. Kiefer, Mr. A.H. Kiefer, the, the uh, banker here in town, and businessman, and, and, and uh, just a, a tomball promoter. And, and, and then also, um, I think Mr. George Nicklo, who at, for some period of time was the, uh, the superintendent uh, of, the, of the humble uh, camp out here, or the whole humble operation, which was significant and big uh, and important. Uh, and my dad, who was, of course, a whole generation younger, and then I, I'm pretty sure there was a fourth, and I cannot remember. Anyway, off they drive in Mr. Kiefer's big old Cadillac to, to go to Austin for the meeting. Well, somewhere along the way, they had a flat mm. tire. And, of course, dad being the youngest, he's probably in his 20s, maybe, maybe 30, I don't know what. He got the, the privilege of, of uh, changing the tire and under the direction of Mr. Kiefer and Mr. Nicklo and, and the other gentleman. And one, I remember him telling me that this, these Cadillacs had these fender guards. That's probably not the right name, but like the wheel, what covered up the wheel well, that you had to get off the thing to change the tire. You had to get, it, it was removable. And apparently they fought that for a pretty good bit on the side of the road, wherever they were. And I think it was hot. And uh, anywho, they finally got the tire changed and, and, um, and, and dad... I think did all the heavy lifting and they did the directing. But uh, anyway, that's just a, a tongue in cheek. But when they got to Austin, now, this is fascinating to me that the, that the committee, the highway committee, and they were in charge of probably allocating dollars. They said, look, we got X number of dollars. We'll give you a choice. We'll give Tom Ball, we'll give you all a choice. You want to have a bridge on 149 over where we used to, over the railroad, south of town. We used to call it the S curve. Uh, which is, I think there was a big Houston Lighting and Power uh, plant, but it might not have been there then anyway. But on 149, do you want to have a bridge over that so you don't have to worry about trains, or do you want us to buy more right away for the, for the what then was, I think, 149? Might have been West Montgomery Road, but or 149. So they thought about that, and they said, no, we want the right of way. So the state, over the next number of years, it didn't happen instantly, but I think they ended up buying 120 feet of right-of-way, where before there might have been, I really don't know, so I shouldn't guess, but probably at the most, maybe 60 feet. But that, I'm, I'm convinced that that move, and that was done back, it had to have been, maybe it was in the 50s, uh, so, you know, 70 years ago. But that, that probably had a lot to do with a lot of the future development that was able to occur along 240, and certainly benefited Tom Ball from a... Mm business and just a, 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 a transportation, you know, standpoint. I remember kids in high school or in school that I got to know who were new and their parents had moved. I, for some reason, I just remember Stagecoach Farms, and, and that was a new development then, and they were driving down, and the dads or the moms, whoever, the workers were driving uh, to downtown Houston to go to work from way out here. And of course, a lot of people do that, right? But then... Um, you know, the, the, they probably wouldn't have moved out there had there not been good roads. Yeah. And, and there, was a, there was a little group that called themselves the Tomball Good Roads Committee. But uh, they were looking out for and speaking up for um, the interests, you know, of our area where, 
which I think, and it just, it paid dividends. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's, you got to have good transportation. Mm -hmm. So who's in this photo? So that photo is, uh, that's my, uh, my Uncle Howard and my Aunt Dottie, Dorothy, my Aunt Dottie, and my dad, Roy. So those are the three children of Roy C. Hall Sr. and, and Nellie uh, Hall. We officed in that little building. It was kind of kind of amusing. There you go. Yeah, that, there you go. Yeah. That, so that was that was it. <laughs> it was like uh, I think his friends kidded him about it. It was like looked like Law West of the Pecos, you know that kind of thing. Cool old building. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. Where did that uh, building sit? Well, it sat initially uh, basically about where McDonald's is today. Mm. And my folks, they my, my dad, they owned that property down there for a long time. And um, and then when McDonald's came in, we scooched over the building some to be just next next to them, and uh, the the uh, and so it just kind of stayed there until I want to say, I guess the the ni the nineties, early nineties probably, because then we were we were selling you know we sold some the property was developing and and uh, so we moved it off of there, but. That's where uh, I officed and worked with Dad in the insurance and in, in some little bit of real estate too, over the years. And so then, after he sold Hall Motor Company, is it, did he go into business? Yeah, he did. He did. So the Ford uh, uh, Motor Company, the, the the mothership Ford, had encouraged their dealers uh, to get insurance licensed, so they could maybe begin to sell, I guess, auto insurance and, and uh, along with selling a car. Right, so uh, and it's funny to hear him talk about. It. I think the dealers kind of resisted that; they didn't want to do that. But he did it and got licensed. And so, the origins of the insurance agency were in the latter years of his Ford uh, hmm. career. And so, when he uh, got out of the uh, the car business, he started the insurance agency initially at home in our dining room. You know, he had the everything spread out over the dining room table, and uh, and that's kind of how that started. And then at some point after that, he got the Got the little building there and moved in and and, uh, and did that for uh, well <clears throat> until his death in '85 and I had been there with him since '78 uh, and then ran it for another um, let's see till about uh, when was that I guess till about 1998 or so so I ran it for I mean I, I kept it going for another how many years that is so um, earlier you told us you graduated from Tom behind uh -huh. with the SMU right? I did. Where, where did you get, graduate SMU? Yes, I graduated uh, in 1978 with a Bachelor of Business Administration, BBA. What mm -hmm. did you do after that? What came to work for <laughs> Hall Insurance Agency and Hall Properties is what I did. I interviewed with some people up in Dallas and was kind of torn because my girlfriend at the time, who ultimately has, has become my wife, thankfully, uh, was going to North Texas up in Denton. And I thought, well, do I, maybe I should... I, I was torn. I thought maybe I ought to stay up there, and so I interviewed with a couple of uh, companies in Dallas, and then I decided to come to work for uh, for Dad in Tomball, and I'm really, really kind of glad I did. I'll, I'll tell you, I was not overpaid to be uh, working for my for my Dad there in Tomball, but I got such great uh, experience and and uh, just all the people in and out of that office, and and, and being kind of a, a fly on the wall uh, for a lot of interactions that my dad was having with all kind of things not just business but uh you know the college was a big was a big deal he was he right last couple of two or three years before he passed away he was on the board of the college board of trustees of the what now is lone star college and uh, had a great interest in and, and helped uh, with others to get first of all tomball isd in the college district because there was a little thing about contiguous local school districts and and right before that first vote happened, where uh, then uh, Klein apparently pulled out. I've read that two or three ways that Klein ISD pulled out of it, so we weren't contiguous, so we couldn't get in initially. Mm. And then, but they, but he and, and Diane Nicholson at the time, Diane Holland, worked real closely with, uh, I believe, Don Henderson at the time, our either state senator, I believe, the state senator, helped to carry a bill up there. They referred to it as the Tomball Bill to get non-contiguous local school districts in Harris County, <laughs> the ability to, to vote themselves into the district, so then Tomball did. And anyway, and obviously there's a campus out here now, Lone Star College, Tomball, which is wonderful and great, and so many 
not, I was going to say so many kids. It's not only just kids coming out of high schools. That's a lot of it. But uh, also adults going back for other sorts of training and associate. Anyway. It's an amazing I, I, campus. It, it, yeah, it is. So, so he was involved in that sort of thing a lot in, in uh, the roads I've mentioned and, you know, Chamber of Commerce and Rotary Club and all that sort of thing. I do think there's a history, a, le a legacy, and you have it too in your family where uh, because of that uh, volunteerism that, that started two and three generations ago, I mean, if you, that's just the way things got done, you know, out here because there wasn't a lot of... There wasn't a lot of money in, in municipal budgets for that sort of thing, or the county budget, or the or the. There just wasn't. So you, 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 you volunteered and you, you, you served. Uh, so that lots of people did that. How long were we in the insurance business there at the Hall Insurance? So that was about twenty years. So I got out, yeah, about a little bit over twenty years, mm -hmm. and now I've been about uh, twenty-five years now with uh, Edward Jones Investments. And what do you do with them? Well, I um, I help people reach and achieve their financial goals. You know, help <laughs> make sense of investing is the ta tagline used to say. So I work with people to to you know be able to to simplify and organize their financial lives and, and retire when they want to, and hopefully pay for their kids' college if that's a goal of theirs, and without a whole lot of debt. You know, when it's all over and done with, and and uh, maybe buy that second home or a lake house or. Uh, you know, that sort of stuff. I work with people with investments and, and uh, tailored to what they're hoping to, to do based on what their priorities are. Where's your office now? Office is at uh, 425 Holdreth. And what did your wife, Laurel, do after? So Where Laurel, did she go to college? Laurel went to college at the University of North Texas. Back then it was called North Texas State University. And she got an interior design degree. I guess it was a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree, but in interior design. And so for the first uh, five or six or seven years that she was out of school, uh, she, and, and we were married, we got married shortly after her graduating, uh, she worked for Edward uh, Perot Design Associates in Houston, a great, great firm, and uh, did a lot of design work there with them. And then uh, a couple of, two, I'm, I'm going to get wrong on the years, but then once we moved to Tomball, back out here to Tomball in 1984, and... Um, she worked for uh, a couple of few years uh, for the Corner Collection. You know, Shirley Manuel owned that. And, uh, and then uh, kind of did things on her own for a little while. And then we started, we had, uh, had our children. And uh, she stayed at home with them a pretty good bit. And, uh, and now she's very active in, in you know, BSF, she's, which is Bible Study Fellowship. And she's doing, uh, she paints, and uh, she's being a grandmother Lolo to uh, our grandson, Dean, which is a lot of Probably a full-time job. Of fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's, what was her maiden yeah. name? Her maiden name is Brown, Laurel Brown. And where was their family, where did they live growing up? I'm, I'm, glad, you, I'm glad you've asked, because I'd be in trouble if this didn't get put out there. So they lived, when, when they, they lived in, they started out in Houston, I, and I'll back up a little bit. Her parents, Laurel's parents... Stan and June Brown are actually both Canadian citizens. Hmm. Uh, Stan, born and raised in Toronto, in June in a little town called Barrie, B-A-R-R-I-E, uh, in Ontario, about an hour north of Toronto uh, is where she grew up. And they met uh, shortly after, uh, high, I guess, high school. And when they got married in the early early 50s, I believe it was, uh, they, uh, interesting, they had a friend that had come down to Texas, to Houston, and th this friend wrote them or called them back, probably wrote them back saying, hey, Stan, y'all might want to think about coming down here to Houston. My, my, my father-in-law, Stan, was working in uh, some uh, form. It was a dresser. We would call it dresser industries. I think it was, no, 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 I'm wrong about that. It was McDonnell, like the McDonnell Douglas. But he worked in some area of refrigeration hmm. for that corporation. And so his friend said, Houston is going to be, Houston or New Orleans are going to be the air conditioning capitals of the world. You need to get down here and work in refrigeration. Because I think it was just apparently early 50s, I guess, refrigeration, air conditioning was just starting to happen. So down they came. They moved to Houston. And, and Mr. Brown worked in the refrigeration, uh, I guess, air conditioning business for, for a little while. But then went to school at the University of Houston, night school, weekends and got uh, an, some engineering uh, education from them, 
and ultimately ended up working as a mechanical, he got a mechanical engineering uh, certification or degree and worked in that field for the rest of his career uh, for uh, companies like, uh, oh, I think, well, he worked on a lot of the refinery plants down around the ship channel area. Uh, I think Bechtel he worked for for a little while. He also worked for uh, C.E. Lummis Company, which did big, big uh, contracting outfits, and he did a lot of, of the engineering stuff. So they were in Houston, and, and they moved out to Spring Cypress Road, not too far off of 149 at the time. North or, I mean, east or west. So just a little bit west, right behind, you know, there at that main corner, there was, all, all, for many years, was Glenlock Farms. They had, they had cattle running there. Glenlock was, was, was it Glenlock? Yeah, was down the way, but, uh, or the Glen, yeah. And they lived right back behind there in a, in a uh, just, just a, a 40 acres. And, and they had some friends that had bought some land right next to it. And they said, hey, why don't you buy some of this? So they did. You they know, went to Tomball schools. What year they bought out there, mm. roughly? So I believe that my wife was a, I don't know, say maybe a first grader, so 50, early 60s, probably 64-ish, somewhere around in there, I think. And I was, maybe 65, I was thinking 60, back, uh, we had uh, Joanne Bovinghausen, mm -hmm. she was later married to yeah. Earhart. Yes, Her they were right down had there. that corner down yep. there, was it? Moving house and property that they bought. I, it or could close well. To it? it it might have been. It was close to it for sure yeah. because there's a, there was I think there's a moving house and lane down there. Mm -hmm. uh, so a lot. Yes, that was very close. I know right on the corner was uh, I believe Manning's grocery. Sheila Manning is now she, Sheila Lukey. I think her her family parents own that. That would have been the northwest corner of Spring Cypress in 149. There was I a, think that was the that, store that, that right? Moving Houses had earlier. Than that, that was probably that. Okay, yes. Yeah. So right there, you turned right, went down just a, maybe a quarter of a mile, maybe not that far, and turned left and went down a little lane back to their house in the woods back there. Hmm. Interesting thing, the, the, so they were lifelong Methodists. Well, uh, in Houston, they had gone to the uh, Memorial Drive Methodist Church. The Browns did. So when they came to Tomball, I think they went back into Houston a few times before deciding, you know, that's, a, that's probably a long drive. We need to see if we need to find a church out here toward Tomball. So they came to Tomball Methodist one Sunday, which is where our family attended. And uh, that afternoon, <clears throat> my, uh, my mother and also Dorothy Moore uh, went out to visit them. And I think Dorothy, because I think the Moores, you know, then I'm not sure if they lived there or not, but they lived down Spring Cypress Road, I know, for a number of years. So they might have been out there in her neck of the woods. But uh, mom and, and they went out and met the Browns or, or, or just went out and thanked them for coming and maybe took a little gift and visited with them a little bit. And uh, I like to think that they, and then, and the Browns kept coming. And of course, you know, I got to know Laurel there. She was, of course, you know, when you're, when you're nine and seven, you're just a little squirt. You're not thinking about anything. Like, but I knew the family. You know, our families were friends exactly. and our parents were friends. Uh, and as we, we grew and got older and in junior high and then high school, that, that Laurel has a sister, Jenny, Jennifer, who uh, is, was in my grade. Laurel was two grades behind me. And then there was a brother, their older brother, Chris, is, uh, was in my brother Carl's grade. So we all kind of were you know, friends with one another and going to MYF together, that sort of thing. And um, anyway, long story short, that was, uh, I think... Uh, that was a serendipitous. That was a, that was kind of a God thing that, uh, that 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 their family came to our church, and Laurel and I ultimately ended up getting married. <laughs> so how long y'all been married now? We have been married uh, since 1980. I'm gonna have to do the math. We're coming up on so 43 years. Coming record. up on 44. Yeah, yeah. All right. <laughs> this is another photo you have. Yes, I, I love that photo. Tell us. Who yeah, that is. So that is uh, that's my dad. Uh, and I'm guessing probably shortly after his uh, midshipman school training in, in Columbia, or maybe during that uh, photo, and then, and then probably not long after. So he probably was all of about 23 years old, you know, and, and, and one of the older fellows that, were, that was on the ship, uh, you know, most of them were teenagers right out of high school. But that was, uh, yeah, that's who that is. That's a lot of responsibility for a teenager to handle, isn't it? When isn't that the truth? To war Man, I'm alive. I know. Wow. It's hard to imagine. Even for 23 yeah. years right. old, it's right. amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So mm. uh, this was a cool photo. I love this mm -hmm. one. Uh, tell us. So this, um, this is a, a, a picture of a group of Rhodes Scholars. 
from uh, Tom Ball. Now, this is the first grade class of Miss Billy Sue Williams, uh, including uh, me and a number of my, my classmates, uh, not the least of which is Todd Stallings, the brother of my uh, interviewer here. Todd, right next to us, they usually put us in the front because we were short. Uh, me with the glasses, and there's Todd right there, and lots of uh, great people. A lot of other Tomball families. There are. The there's a Fairley in there. There's a Bogues. Um, there's Rhonda Poteet. Her dad was in the school business. Ronnie Gilbert, Kevin Graham, one of Norman Graham's children. There's a, is that, I believe, uh, there's a Kaminsky. Um, I think Suzanne Warren's in there. Her dad Whitehead, was, yeah. Her dad was Dr. Warren, right? Right, yes, <clears throat> yes. That's uh, a great photo. Yeah, there's another uh, see Whitehead. Let's see here. So a lot of you um, mm -hmm. stayed in school together for all the way through, didn't you? A lot of us did, yes. That's, that's true. There was, uh, I mean, it was always real obvious if a new kid came in, you know, because there, there weren't all that many new kids. But there were some. But, uh, yeah, many of us stayed together through, you know, kindergarten through 12th. So that was kind of cool. And this next one, mm -hmm. what is this one? So this is uh, second grade. That Billy Sue Williams, that first picture there was first grade. This is second grade for me. In, uh, and that's, our teacher was Linda Lowe, Ms. Lowe. And um, with some of the same, some of the usual suspects in the photo here. But uh, good group. There's Kevin Graham again. Kenny Rumfield next to me. Uh, Luann Jones, of course, Mr. Uh, Ms. Jones were teachers. Kenny Rumfield's dad was always the umpire. He right? was, he sure was. That's I exactly. Him calling yeah. our, our little league game. Yes, he did. Uh, let me see who else is in there. There's Captain Hirsch. There's a Hirsch. Uh, Whitehead again. Poteet, Jones, Warren, Suzanne Warren, Gary Hardiman, Donald Cook. A lot of those people still around Tomball? I think some are. But yeah. I, I don't know. Maybe not a lot, mm -hmm. but uh, but there are definitely some. Sure. This looks like a great mm -hmm. photo of your yeah. mom. <laughs> that's right. That's yeah. That's my mother. One of the uh, you know at Olin Mills uh, church photograph. <laughs> yeah. This this actually is a, a just a newspaper article when uh, that I just ran across about uh, when my grandfather passed away, and. It's, uh, there certainly is a family resemblance, but um, he, uh, it was, uh, I believe, 1950, and he ha uh, passed away out on what they refer to as the farm, um, it, and they, they had some land with, with a house on it, farmland, and a few, few animals, I think, a horse named Nellie, the same name as my, my grandmother. Anyway, uh, at Jones Road, at the intersection today of Jones Road and Grant Road, and that would be the south east corner, which subsequently our family, I believe, sold it to the Cypress Fairbanks Independent School District. They've got, there's some schools on there. I want to say Matsky, Matsky there, there maybe. Yeah. yeah. So there's some schools and some ball fields and things there. Anyway, but uh, anyway, that's just where he, he passed away there. They had a, they had a farmhouse that I think uh, that they spent time at. Uh, but yeah, that was 1950, kind of a, uh, kind of a, Sudden death kind of thing, heart attack thing, of course. But other other memories. One thing I do uh, like to think about is the fact that we uh, and, I, and I think a prior interviewee mentioned this sort of thing. But you know, we a lot of our teachers in school were people that we they were neighbors of ours, and our parents knew them and might have gone to church together with them or that sort of thing. And and uh, so this uh, that, that was pretty. Uh, you know, there's a feeling of security in that. Uh, also, there's a feeling of you weren't going to get get away with much. If you uh, if you tried, because your teachers knew your parents, your parents knew your teachers, and and uh, that was I had and I already mentioned Billy Sue Williams and Linda Lowe and Ms. Walleen and uh, Ms. Swan and Ms. Calvert in fifth grade I think I said, but um, that was that was uh, those were good memories. The, uh, Do you have your mm -hmm. a favorite memory that you like to think about or a favorite <laughs> event that you think of here in Tomball? Oh golly. Um, Oh, there was, I tell you what, there was a lot of excitement in the, I believe in the, eight, in somewhere in the 80s, I think where two consecutive uh, Tomball High School football teams went to the state final playoff game. I think they might have lost each year, but that was a lot of excitement associated with that. Uh, I think Lance Pavlis was, was like a quarterback at that point in time, but that was a little later in the 80s. That was a big deal. It's fun to see the town come together for things like that. Um, 
You know, I think we had the, uh, and I'm going to get this wrong, was it the one, the bicentennial? We had the, what did Tom Ball have? The, maybe, it, maybe it was the Sessman Center. Was that the, the, the 75th? Yeah. And then I remember that culminated with a big thing out at the, at the stadium, at the high school football stadium. And I want to say that uh, George Bush, H.W. Bush, I believe came and spoke. Did he not? Yeah. Was he the... Surprise. Maybe the vice president at the time, or perhaps he was still in Congress. But uh, when was our <laughs> – that was a big deal. That was kind of fun. Um, I remember the Goodyear blimp being stationed over at uh, I-45 for a time. It was at Hooks Airport. I think when they were building the – I'm saying station. That's probably the wrong uh, – Blimp base. The blimp base. That was kind of cool to have that Goodyear blimp around a lot uh, because that was, that was fun. I think you know, people could – Right on that thing, I guess, if they signed up for it and got over there. Hooks Airport, just in general, is, a, is an awesome uh, uh, feature or benefit to, to Tom Ball, I think. Uh, uh, having a private airport like that with a, with a tower, an F, a FAA tower, that's not that common, I don't think. You mentioned Sebesta's City Cafe. That, yeah. was, that was a good place to eat. And we yes. had a, a few other places, but in the early days, there weren't a lot of choices. But no. Hooks Airport had a little... Yep. The restaurant out there you does. can eat, right? Yes, it does. And, and you know, Amelia um, Edwards, if, as I recall, was, uh, I think, ran that kitchen for a lot of years. Uh, and it was good. And I think, I think the Hooks grew a lot of their own vegetables and things. Or Anyway, it was good food. It, it still is. I actually like to go out there. It's Aviator's Grill now or something like that. But it's still pretty good. Yeah. I, like, I like to go out to the airport. It's, uh, that's a novel kind of a thing to go out there and have lunch and see planes coming in and out. You know, that's uh, not every little town has that. So can uh, you describe for folks that didn't grow up here like you did, what it felt like growing up as a kid in Tomball? Oh boy, that's a good question. Well, I have thought about that a lot. I, I, I think that we, um, you know, I felt safe. Uh, my, my, my parents also must have <laughs> felt we were safe too because we could Walk well, ride our bikes, just kind of be home by dark thing, and and uh, it was pretty easy to to, to navigate around. And, and if they were, were trying to find us, they might call call around a little bit, and somebody we might have seen us, you know, kind of thing, and locate us. Uh, didn't have cell phones, but uh, I think that was a really really fun thing. Uh, people in the businesses knew we knew, and they knew us, and. Um, then everybody yeah. knew the policeman. That's true. Remember that's right. Mr. Bolton. I do. Mr. Bolton was. The, yes, right. Yes. And heck, he lived just down the street from us. <clears throat> but uh, yeah, we we. Uh, yeah, my dad used to say that you know, son, if you ever you find us, if you get arrested and have to be in jail, well, you just be prepared to spend the night because I'm not going to come get you. You know, kind of thing. So <laughs> I never had to test that theory or anything. I mean, I <laughs> don't know if that was an idle threat or just a, but it worked. So I, I tried to st- stay out of tried to stay out of trouble. Um, for the most part, the, the, um, I was having another thought. Oh, we had, you know, in high school, so I was in the last class that graduated from Tomball High School that was on Main Street, which is now TIS, Tomball Intermediate School. So the, at the year after I graduated, they, they opened up the, the campus on Quinn Road, uh, which they, at the time I think was Sandy Lane. Um, but it, it, when the campus was on Main Street in town, on, Tom, uh, on Main Street, we had open campus for lunch. So we, there, was a, there was a hamburger place right across the street called the Gold Post. And as soon as that bell rang, and usually I, I was in band in high school, so we were out back in the band hall, which was a little bit you know, farther away. We would run on a dead sprint to the Gold Post, and I never, there was a side window where all the kids went to pick up their burgers and, and, uh, and eat them. And, and, uh, and I remember Miss Hines worked back there a number of years when I was in high school and pretty well knew our orders and uh, we had them ready uh, and, and that was a fun thing. We probably paid all of about 85 cents you know for a hamburger and fries back then something like that. And that goal post was sort of right in front of the, the old pool right? Yeah. Yes it, it was. In front of but yes. down, down uh, yeah, east right. a little bit? Exactly and next to the old uh, what I think was next to the old administration building at the time which now the fire department uses for training or something I believe. But yeah, that was uh, that's right. And the the uh, there was a swimming pool there, which the YMCA used, and I guess the school a little bit used it as well for a long time. It's covered up now, but uh, the the um, that was kind of cool. And a little story about that goalpost. There was an actual goalpost, a football field type size goalpost, out in front of that 
building. And, and the, the reason for that was is that the owners of that goalpost were, were, na uh, were Cullen, oh, I'm not going to remember Mrs. Barnett's name, but the Barnetts. Linda Barnett was a couple of years ahead of me in class, in school. And, uh, but Cullen Barnett played for Sam, played football for Sam Houston State University, or it might have been Teachers College, but for Sam Houston. And one year they played Rice University and beat them in a major upset at the time, and Cullen Barnett kicked the winning field goal. And I, I guess at some point he decided when he was going to open up a, a hamburger joint in Tomball, he was going to put a goal post out there to kind of commemorate that, which uh, I've always thought that was fascinating. Uh, and I don't know what happened to the goalpost. I mean, the goal, that, was the, that was a great burger joint. Kind of, they had pinball machines in there and, and a, you know, a kind of a hangout room for kids, which they welcomed, and, uh, the, and, and it was good, good old burgers. And, and the fountain drinks, of course, you could get uh, just, uh, you know, it was a great place to hang out. But that was, uh, you know, back in, uh, uh, during Prohibition times, uh, it was obviously illegal to, to, to sell or to manufacture, you know, alcohol, I mean, there's probably a lot more to it than that, but alcoholic products. But there were some people uh, that, you know, the local people knew were probably making uh, in their own private stills, make, making alcohol, making whiskey, making something out in the country, usually. And, uh, and I think, the story goes, I think my dad, my grandfather uh, knew that. And so he noticed, you know, I told you that the IGA, the Braddock's grocery store was right across the street. So he saw some people that he knew going in there to probably just to shop uh, that he, I guess, knew they had a still uh, out in the country. And he went over there to get a Coca-Cola or something and said kind of in a loud voice to Mr. To Mr. Bradigan uh, that, oh, he understood that the revenuers were in town. Revenuers was, the, I guess, the name, the nickname for the government people who might be out there looking to to shut down somebody's still or to arrest them. I don't know what they would do, but they were against making, uh, making your own alcohol. Uh, and they'd shut you down if they knew about it. So he kind of said it real loud. Well, apparently those people, whoever those <laughs> gentlemen were that were up to that, kind of heard that, overheard that, and they shot out of there apparently, went out, went out west to, to town, and I think destroyed their, their still and got rid of it all. And then, of course, it was... And, and I've read, I think my grandfather was a, a practical jokester. It was not, he didn't, he didn't know if there was any revenues in the town or not. He just said that out loud. And uh, they found out it was apparently a little bit of a joke. Well, not too many days later, one of the four uh, Hall Motor Company vehicles, uh, as, as we used to say, turned up missing. And it was, it was <laughs> long story short, those same guys had come and stolen one of the uh, cars and took it out to Rose Hill someplace and strung it up in their barn <laughs> and hid it from, from, uh, from my grandfather. And then I guess eventually they, they, they told him or they found out about all that and, and uh, you know, kind of no harm done, I guess, and uh, got the car back. But that was uh, the kind of thing. Apparently, uh, it might be frowned upon today. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if people get away with that today or not, but I think we... Uh, that's just some silly story. I just have heard that about my yeah. my grandfather doing that, but uh, hmm. I'm glad he they didn't shoot him or something. Yeah. <laughs> well, I appreciate you coming all got today it. and sharing all this time and yeah. sharing your stories. It's a hmm. very good legacy the Hall family has here in hmm. Tomball. Thanks. Well, you're welcome. Thank you, Kyle, for what you're doing, and and Mr. Watts, Bob Watts, for for filming. I appreciate this. This is really a. A couple of people I've mentioned this to have said, wow, what a great idea. So uh, thank you guys. Thank you all.